weighs 300 pounds. And the point is someone who weighs 300 pounds is physiologically and genetically different than somebody who doesn't. And we just don't know. You know, we can't treat, one of the major problems in this field is it's full of people who, you know, um, chronic exercisers, runners, and bicycle racers who all think that if everybody else just did what they did, they would also be lean. And everybody else is different than they, from they are. And that's what, you know, you can tell how different they are by how fat they are. Other questions? I have a question. Okay. So Asians eat, Asians eat a lot of rice, and, and yet they don't have obesity. What, what's up with that? They didn't have obesity. Um, this is a classic uh, counter-argument, and it's, it's um, one of the ones actually that has confounded the field since the 1920s. Because in the 1920s, there was a lot of discussion about there were dramatically increasing diabetes diagnosis rates throughout the world um, in association with dramatically increased sugar consumption from the 1870s onward. I mean, in some cities, uh, diabetes diagnosis increased by 15-fold over like 20, 30 years. A lot of this was assuredly a diagnosis effect. People started getting life insurance. When they started getting life insurance, they started getting tested for diabetes. And so then it was discovered that they had it, so the rates went up. But the changes were so significant that it, it was the, the expert statisticians of the day who were smart guys in statistics is not rocket science. Um, you know, said there's, there's, there's an effect that can't be explained here, and it's quite likely from the sugar that's also been skyrocketing. And then Elliot Jocelyn, who was a leading diabetes specialist in the United States from the year after the invention of insulin until his death in the 1960s, said the Japanese eat high-carb diets, <laughs> all carbs are the same, and they don't have diabetes. Um, and therefore, sugar doesn't cause diabetes. And he didn't realize that sugar is fundamentally different from other carbohydrates. And the Japanese had among the lowest sugar consumption in the world. And Southeast Asians in general have not consumed sugar in any quantities until recently. And in the early 1960s, when I looked at this, the one study I found had sugar consumption in Japan at about 40 pounds per capita when it was around 120 pounds in the US then. So they were consuming in the early 1960s what we were consuming in around the 1840s. Um, so one uh, reason why it's possible that sugar is the fundamental problem, and by sugar I mean sugar or high fructose corn syrup, is this observation that Southeast Asian nations that didn't eat sugar um, didn't have these problems. Um, the genetics could be different also, but it is conceivable, among other reasons, it's conceivable that if we could just get rid of the sugar or cut it down to something, you know, maybe a third of what it is today, we would get rid of most of these diseases. Yeah, I think um, the formula is different. I think it's, um, it's marginally lower in fat and higher in carbohydrates. Some formulas, boggles my mind, I haven't looked into this greatly, but some formulas have um, high fructose corn are sweetened. Um, most all of them, yeah. Most all of them? I yeah. hope not the one my son is getting. Um, and, like, and they also have a lot of soybean oil in them. Yeah, so I, that would be my, I mean, this idea that it's because, you know, one, again, that researchers tried to ram the sort of overeating hypothesis onto this also. So this idea that it's because mothers, when they feed the babies from a bottle, are somehow compelled to make them finish the bottle, which they don't do because they don't know how much the kid's getting when they breastfeed. Um, I think that's nonsense. I, th I do think it's purely something having to do with the composition. And it could be that when the kids drink from the bottle, they get the food faster. So it has this effect that, you know, a greater effect on insulin secretion because of that. But, um, and that's the kind of problem you run into in this problem, because how are you going to, you can't just get people to nurse, you know? And there's probably, you know, the more jobs a mother has, the less she's going to nurse, the more she's going to, um, you know, so there's assuredly a, a, a socioeconomic gradient that goes with nursing and other things, and it's hard to start messing with that without looking like you're being, you know, biased against um, the poorer people or certain populations. So have you given any thoughts to uh, Robert Lustig's uh, premise, essentially, that it's really all about the, uh, the fructose? Well, it's funny. I am presently getting, uh, I've got a grant from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation 
to write a book about fructose and high sucrose and high fructose corn syrup, and I've talked as well. Robert Lustig is a um, pediatric endocrinologist at UC San Francisco who's got a very compelling lecture online called Fructose, a uh, Bitter Poison, a Bitter Truth. Um, it's definitely worth seeing. If anything will scare you off sugar. Um, I've actually talked with Rob about writing this book together, but we have fundamental differences in what we believe. And one thing, now that I've, I just moved out to the you know, San Francisco area, we're supposed to meet in the next month and see if we can actually do this. Because um, this book, Good Calories, Bad Calories, got less, I got less reviews in the academic press for that than I did for my Cold Fusion book, which came out three years after Cold Fusion. Um, happened, like far after anyone stopped caring. And I believe the reason is with the Cold Fusion book, I was confirming that the establishment scientists knew what they were doing and the challenge of the establishment were quacks. And in this case, I'm arguing that the challengers are the people who knew what they were doing and that the establishment scientists are effectively quacks. And it's hard to deal with that. But anyway, it could, on one level, this idea that it could fundamentally be the fructose. That what you have to do to create this obesogenic environment is become insulin resistant. And when you get insulin resistant, when your muscle lean tissue becomes insulin resistant, you start directing fuel towards your fat tissue. And that insulin resistant, it is conceivable, is caused fundamentally by the fructose in the diet and the effect of the fructose on the liver which then causes systemic insulin resistance, which then causes the fat tissue to decide to start taking in fat to ameliorate the problem. And again, this is the kind, I wouldn't be at all surprised, but I think once you start, if that's true, once you start getting fat, simply removing the sweets, the sugar isn't enough, because the world is full of people who are obese who know enough not to eat sweets and don't, and doesn't make a damn bit of difference. Um, so, and that's the fun, I mean, if you focus on the sugar, like you might solve if we never had sugar, we might not have these diseases. <laughs> but having sugar, then the other carbohydrates become problematic as well. Uh, one of the most disheartening things I've seen is what you just mentioned, is that your book you know, doesn't get many reviews in science or nature and those journals. Do you have any other hypothesis as to how these journals pick the books that they're going to review? Because sometimes the books pick, you know, or you, know, you really wonder why they pick this particular book. <laughs> I mean, you know, I, this stuff, I can understand how journals work. Um, that's rocket. Um, I think the problem with my book is, who do you give it to? I mean, even if they want, and it's funny, most of, much of the fundamental, the, the, the first research for this book was written in a series of award-winning articles for science, and science didn't review it. But the question is, when you've got a book that says everyone in the establishment is wrong, who do you give it to to review? And actually, it was a problem with doing the writing myself, because one thing you do as a researcher, as a journalist, is you have an idea. And even if it's counterintuitive, I did this when I wrote this New York Times Magazine story in 2002 that was fairly famous, um, What If Fat Doesn't Make You Fat? And you, get, you find the 10 people who agree with you. And obviously, you know, uh, uh, hopefully, one of them will be from Harvard, and one of them will be from Stanford. And, you know, and then you quote them agreeing with you, and it gives your argument credibility. But once you've spent 20 pages of a book it's explaining that the whole field is pathological, <laughs> you can't do it anymore. Now you have to figure out a way to write it. I had this problem with Michael Pollan, who's an acquaintance of mine, when he, he wrote the New York Times Magazine story that became uh, In Defense of Food. And he was ripping apart uh, clinical trials based using Walter Willett from Harvard to quoting Walter Willett to do this for him. And then two pages later on, he's um, you know, citing, ripping apart the nurse's health study, which is Walter Willett's study. <laughs> so you, you, in order to have internal consistency and credibility in your own work, once you've established that nobody can be trusted except you, who, and it, it makes it a very tricky problem for writing, because I don't, you know, you can't just quote X from Harvard because he agrees with you. Um, and it's one reason why the, this good calories, bad calories is 500 pages long and has 160 pages of references and bibliography is because I have to make sure that I'm never saying trust me. 
because there's no, you know, you have to, and even, and with everything, like once, the reviews I did get, often I'd be, I'd be criticized for um, going on and on and on about certain aspects of the data, and then they'd say, but the author leaves out this study, you know, and it's like, well, I could have discussed that one too, but then I would have went on and on and on and on. <laughs> um, anyway. Well, thank you very much. Thank you.